All right, so we're going to continue talking about linear perspective uh, with this week's homework. And uh, I, some of this is in the previous videos uh, in more depth, so I'm going to gloss over a little bit pretty quickly. Uh, but just as a brief recap, uh, with linear perspective, we've been talking about uh, using the tools of linear perspective to construct things that are very hard to draw freehand. And mostly, we've been concerned with, you know, drawing rectilinear forms, drawing things like boxes, and using our eye level and our vanishing points to help us construct a continuous sense of space. But there are other objects that linear perspective can also be really useful for helping us construct objects that are hard to draw freehand, and one of those are ellipses. Uh, so let's say I have a subject like my jar here, and I can see that uh, you know, the top, the bottom of these rings is a lot of these kind of circles that are opening and closing at different, uh, to different amounts uh, as it goes above and below my eye level. So let's talk a little bit briefly about how we might help us construct these ellipses. So the first thing I want to do is decide upon my eye level. And I think that my eye level is probably something like about here. Uh, yeah, again, if this were an actual object and not photograph, it would be easier to determine where my eye level was, but for now I'm just kind of estimating based off of how much of the top of this object I can see. And so let's say I want to construct the, uh, the ellipse that forms the top of this jar. There are a few tools that I can combine to help me do this. The first is uh, that simply if I want to draw a circle, Rather than freehanding it, I might decide that it's easier to draw a square. That it's easier to draw a series of straight lines that I think are, are pretty much a square rather than to try and freehand something that is perfectly circular. And the inside of a square, I can draw an X from corner to corner, which marks the center of that square, and then a T through that point, and I found the midpoint of each of my four sides, and that lets me know where my circle should intersect and be parallel to the sides of that square if I circumscribed a circle in there. And that can make it much easier to get a perfectly circular form than just trying to freehand it. And I can do the same thing with a square that is sat back in perspective. that I can draw my X from corner to corner, do my T, and then draw my ellipse inside of that space. And that can be very helpful for uh, you know, getting the general shape of my ellipse down. Uh, another benefit is that, again, if you remember, we are in one point perspective whenever our vision is 90 degrees to one side of an object. Well, a circle, which is what we're looking at, has an infinite number of sides, so we're always 90 degrees to one of its sides. So we can always be in one point perspective when we're working with an ellipse, which is very helpful. So to reconstruct this ellipse over here, I'm just going to start with my single point for one point perspective. I'm going to try and construct uh, a box that I think roughly describes the rectangle that would contain this ellipse. And again, this is in uh, my second linear perspective video, so I'm, I'm skimming over it slightly. And a vertical, and a horizontal. And now I can draw my ellipse inside of the space, and if I then carry this over, that's pretty close. That's that's a pretty good job. And so we can see, uh, you know, by comparing this against an actual photograph, that this really does pretty well construct what we're seeing. Uh, and that as I, again, drop this rectangle down in space, it would reveal more and more of this ellipse, which 
agrees with what I'm seeing. Uh, but uh, let's look at something a little different, a slightly different uh, option for what we might be drawing. Let's say rather than having this ellipse be sitting on a tabletop, which is to say that this top of the jar is parallel to the floor, let's say that rather than that, it's lying on its side. So essentially, whereas before we were working with a box that we can kind of imagine oops, as being in one point perspective, that the top is parallel to the floor and we're 90 degrees parallel to one side, that rather this jar is kind of in two point perspective, that we're seeing more sides of it. Obviously, I'm exaggerating how close those vanishing points are, but you kind of get the sense of why I'm, I'm looking at that. We want to sit our ellipse into this face here. So, first things first, uh, we can be, we can simplify things a little bit again by the fact that again, we are kind of still working in one point perspective. We're no longer 90 degrees parallel to one side, but our ellipse only exists on one face of this object. So I really only need to be thinking about my one vanishing point because I'm only constructing my one face here in order to draw this object. So I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to start with my one vanishing point. I'm going to try and estimate how tall I think this form is, where I think the back of it is. Again, I'm kind of trying to imagine these lines that circumscribe this ellipse. And I'm going to do just like I did last time. I'm going to draw my X, draw my T, although this time I will be going to my vanishing point rather than a perfect horizontal. And then we're going to inscribe our ellipse into this space. And now if I take this ellipse I just made and I move it over, I'll find that it doesn't match up. Again, you can kind of imagine that if I were to, uh, rather than having a photograph and moving this over, if this were uh, you know, a pane of glass that I were drawing on, uh, it just doesn't match with what I'm seeing. And the reason is that the axis of my ellipse is not correct. You can kind of imagine that every ellipse has a major and a minor axis. The major axis is the longest dimension of the ellipse. So the line connecting the two apexes, the you know most extreme points of the ellipse, and then the minor axis is 90 degrees to that, and it describes the shortest point of the ellipse. And if I were to, again, put a piece of glass in front of my face and trace this, trace this ellipse, what I would find is that it tilts, that the major axis of that ellipse tilts. And uh, I was talking to some of you in class, you can almost imagine this as, you know, if I think of this ellipse as an egg that's sitting on the ground, that that egg is tilting. And so the question is, how can we determine what degree that egg is tilting at? Uh, and we could measure it uh, visually. We could hold our pencil out in front of our heads, elbow locked, measure that angle. But a lot of linear perspective is about taking the guesswork out of things. So luckily there is a method to determine what the tilt, oops, what the tilt of this ellipse is.
So here's what we're going to do. Rather than uh, drawing our T as a vertical and then a line going to the uh, vanishing point, which describes uh, the, the major and minor axis of our ellipse, we are going to instead, I'm going to redraw my square here. We're going to make our X, and then we're going to draw a line that represents the axis of the cylinder. So essentially, the uh, a point that is going from the center of our X off to the opposite vanishing point of the object. And the vanishing point may or may not be on our page, uh, but essentially we're thinking about if this cylinder is staying on the ground and I were to pass an imaginary line through its center, piercing it straight through the center, what would that, what would the angle of that line be? And it's probably going to be pretty close to parallel with the sides of our ellipse. So I'm going to do my best to emulate that angle that I found. So here I have a line that's piercing through the center of my X. This angle now represents the minor axis of our ellipse. And the major axis exists at 90 degrees to that point. And this isn't 90 degrees in the space. So for example, if I were to draw a vertical line through this ellipse and to this point, we could imagine that this in actual space represents you know, 90 degree corner of a piece of paper or something. But on our page, it's a little more. It might be something like 105 degrees. This is this angle that we just drew down here. This is going to be 90 degrees on the page, as in we could take a square or an edge of a piece of paper and put it in that point and it will be 90 degrees. And this angle, this represents the major axis of our ellipse. You see it's tilting along that angle. And I could take this and now shift this ellipse I've drawn over and find that it much more closely matches the ellipse I'm seeing. So if I want to draw a cylinder which is sitting parallel with the ground plane, then all I need to do is find my vanishing point, construct a rectangle, draw my X, my T will be a vertical and a horizontal, and I can build my ellipse inside of that. If my ellipse is not parallel to the ground plane, so it's staying on its side and it's skewed off such that the box that holds the cylinder is sitting, you know, in two-point perspective to me like this, I want to draw an ellipse like this, I need to draw my X, draw a line through the center of that box, and then align 90 degrees to that, and that is the major axis of my ellipse. So, for homework, I want you to practice this a little bit. In order to practice this, we are going to build an imaginary birdhouse. And your birdhouse can be as intricate as you want, but it has to contain at least three things. And these have to be you know, constructed with a horizon line and a vanishing point. Uh, and I want your box to, or your, your, your birdhouse to consist of at least one large cylinder, 
which in my instance, it goes above and below my eye level, but yours might be entirely above or below. So one large cylinder, which I have a hole in the side, which we are going to construct by building a box, finding the other vanishing point, which is going to be perpendicular to that space, finding the major axis of this ellipse. So a large cylinder, a hole in the cylinder, and a little peg for a bird to sit on, which is also going to follow the same law of finding the axis. Line 90 degrees to that, that will be the major axis of our ellipse. Uh, and then beyond this, you can get as intricate as you want. You could continue to, you know, maybe I want to add a little roof onto my birdhouse or a little base, or I want to hang it from a tree, or I want to make a bird sitting on it, or, or any number of any things that you can invent into your drawing. It can be as complicated as you want, but it can take at least those three things. Something else to keep in mind very briefly is that uh, it may be worth your while also to experiment with placing the hole in different parts of the bird uh, of the birdhouse. And what you'll find is that the closer something gets to our eye level and to our the center of our vision, the less extreme the tilt of the egg is going to be. As a hole gets further down beneath our eye level, that tilt of that egg might get more and more extreme. So in short, if you're placing the hole of your birdhouse right on your eye level, I still want you to use this technique of find the vanishing point and then the major axis, 90 degrees uh, perpendicular to that. But the tilt might not be very noticeable, but it's still there. Uh, so keep that in mind. Email if you have any questions, and uh, I will see you in class.